Hello, everyone. The long-awaited COVID-19 vaccine has been approved in the United States for emergency use and is currently being rolled out at hospitals throughout the country. While Cornell Medicine is committed to keeping you safe and to protecting you and your loved ones, our patients, and our community. In partnership with New York Presbyterian, we are prioritizing administration of COVID-19 vaccinations according to federal and state guidelines and vaccines are expected to be distributed in phases. Our frontline healthcare workers have already begun to receive the vaccine and in the coming weeks and months will begin to be rolled out to the general public. To provide you with more information about this medical milestone, I'd like to turn to Dr. Trip Gulick, Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases, the Rochelle Belfort Professor in Medicine at Wild Cornell Medicine and co-chair of a National Institute of Health panel that is developing treatment guidelines for COVID-19. Dr. Gulick, thank you for bringing your expertise to this conversation. Thanks, Dean Choi, happy to be here. So we'll get right to it, Dr. Gulick. Um, first, let's start with the most fundamental question. Why are we recommending the COVID-19 vaccine and how can it help end the pandemic? Well, the good news is that the two vaccines that are now becoming available both help people who get the vaccines prime their immune system to fight off the coronavirus. So if enough people in the population take the vaccine and develop these responses, there's a real chance that we could make headway in controlling the COVID-19 epidemic. The two leading vaccines in the United States from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna are mRNA vaccines. Can you explain what that means and how they work? Sure. So it's true that we don't currently have an mRNA vaccine. So these two would be the first that we've had in infectious diseases. Having said that, the technology has been worked on for an mRNA vaccine for at least nine or 10 years. What happens is that they take a small sliver of the genes of the virus in the form of RNA, inject it into the muscle cells in the upper arm, and then the muscle cells take up that RNA and use it as a template to make the spike protein of the coronavirus. If you've seen the picture, those are the spikes that come off of the virus itself. Your immune system would then see that spike protein and make a response in the form of antibodies and cells to help fight it off. And then the thinking goes that if you ever came into contact with the real virus, your immune system is already primed to do it. So that's pretty exciting in terms of technology. Wow, we're seeing the advances of science right here. Uh, Dr. Gulick, most importantly, how have the clinical trials demonstrated the vaccine is safe? So the clinical trials of both the Pfizer and the Moderna were large studies, 30 to 40,000 people. And what they did was to take them, divide them randomly in half. So half got the vaccine in each case and half got a placebo shot. So a shot with with really nothing in it at all. And then people were instructed on taking proper precautions, but advised to live their lives. And the people enrolled in the studies were at some risk of COVID, either because of their occupation or where they lived in the world. The primary outcome was who developed a new proven COVID infection. And they took a look and when they saw there was a big imbalance in the population favoring the group that got the vaccine. In fact, in both the studies, the vaccine was 95% effective in avoiding new COVID-19 cases. That's an extraordinary number. That's That'll make it among the best vaccines that we've ever seen. Thank you. Indeed, it's really encouraging to see those results. Is it possible to contract COVID-19 from the vaccine? It is not, it is impossible. Remember, we're not using all the genes of the virus, but just one small sliver that makes the spike protein. So you could not get COVID-19 from receiving the vaccine. Thank you. Both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have been shown to be very effective. Is one better than the other? And 
did their efficacy exceed our expectations? Great question. When the FDA was advising on the design of these large vaccine studies, experts said, wow, we'd like these vaccines to be at least 50% effective for them to be really rolled out. We had no idea how good the vaccines might be. What we learned from the clinical trials is each of the vaccines is approximately 95% effective. That's as good as any other vaccine we have. Measles vaccine, for example, is about 90% effective. So yes, I think it was surprising that these vaccines were actually as good as they were. However, they've not been compared to one another. There's been no Pfizer versus Moderna studies, but judging what we've seen from the independent studies, they both look like they are excellent vaccines. Amazing. How is the vaccine administered and why do we need two doses? So each of the vaccines does require two doses. It's a shot in the arm like many vaccinations. The first one primes the immune system and we know that's somewhat helpful, perhaps getting up to approximately 50% protection. But to achieve that 95% protection, you really do need that second shot to make sure that the immune system is fully primed to make a response. In the case of Pfizer, the two shots are separated by three weeks. With the Moderna vaccine, it's four weeks in between the two. Both are necessary. Thank you. How long does it take for the vaccine to begin working? Well, we know from both the studies that approximately 10 to 14 days after that initial vaccination, that some protection begins to be offered. That's important because it's not like you get the vaccine and you're protected the next day. So it does take a good one to two weeks for the immune system to start working. And then again, getting that second shot is really critical to getting the full benefits from the vaccine. Absolutely, so important to get the second vaccine dose. Have there been side effects or adverse reactions and how are we taking precautions for that? So side effects to vaccinations are pretty common. And the most common seen with the COVID vaccines, as you might guess, is local pain or soreness at the site of injection. Much more rarely, people can have redness or swelling at that site. And then some people have more systemic reactions. So the most common turned out to be either fatigue or headache, less commonly muscle or joint aches, and much less commonly fever. But I wanna say something about all of those side effects. Those actually, surprisingly, are a good thing. What they're telling us is that the immune system is responding to the vaccine. It's already recognizing it as a foreign protein that needs to be dealt with. And so in some sense, you might say that's a good thing that people are getting these modest vaccines. I will also say that serious side effects to these vaccinations are really very uncommon and weren't actually different from just getting a placebo shot, uh, a saline shot in the arm. Thank you. Who will be the first to get the vaccine? So lots of discussion about this nationally and the Centers for Disease Control made some recommendations about priorities. They then left it to the individual states to make their own choices. In general, most states and including here in New York, the top priority was for healthcare workers as well as nursing home residents and employees of long-term care facilities. So these are the groups with the most direct exposure to COVID-19, and these are the groups that are getting the first vaccinations, even as we speak. Thank you, and is there anyone who should not get the vaccine? Yes, the most important group that should not receive the vaccine is anyone who's allergic to any components of the vaccine. Well, you might say, how would I know that? It might be people that have had a serious reaction to a prior vaccination for something else really shouldn't be receiving this vaccination. Other groups simply haven't been tested. So for instance, pregnant or breastfeeding women were not included in the studies. Children under the age of 16 were not included in the studies and people with immunocompromising conditions like cancer or organ transplants 
or uncontrolled HIV infection. None of them were studied in the early studies. So that involves more of a conversation, given that we don't have all the data in terms of how good it is and whether there would be side effects. People really should have conversations with their own doctors before they receive the vaccine in those specific groups. Very helpful and important recommendations, uh, Dr. Gulick. Do you recommend that people who have been tested positive for COVID-19 receive the vaccine? Yes, there is an expert group that the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, convenes, and they made formal recommendations. And included in that was the recommendation that anyone, even who had prior COVID-19, should still receive the vaccination. And you might say, why? Why would that be? Aren't I protected if I have the natural infection? But the point is people can get reinfected. And so that was actually seen on the first study, the Pfizer study. It enrolled a total of 40,000 people. It turns out a thousand of those people had evidence of prior COVID-19. The study showed that that group benefited just as much as the bigger group in terms of avoiding a second COVID infection. Very important uh, recommendations that also do we have any indication of how long will vaccine immunity last or is more time needed to make that determination? I guess I'm asking you, do you have a crystal ball to make your best prediction? Well, with all the excitement of these studies in terms of efficacy and safety, we do need to realize that they're relatively recent. The average time that they followed people on the vaccine studies was only about two months. So we really don't know the answer to that question. How long will these immune responses, the protection against COVID-19, how long will it last after getting the vaccine? We don't know today, but rest assured that all the people that participated in the studies are going to be followed for two years. So we will be getting that kind of information in the months or years to come. And then one last question, uh, Dr. Gulick, if someone has been vaccinated, can they still become infected or infect others? And should they still keep wearing a mask? So three good questions. The first one is if someone gets the vaccination, could they still acquire COVID? And I'll tell you 95% is very good, but of course that leaves 5% of people who got the vaccination, but still, got COVID. So although rare, it is possible. Your second question is also an important one. Does the vaccination reduce the risk of asymptomatic carriage, meaning people who have the virus in their nose or mouth don't have any symptoms and could they still pass it to other people? Does the vaccine prevent that? We don't know the answer to that. There are some intriguing preliminary data with two of the vaccines to suggest that the amount of virus in the nose and mouth is actually reduced by the vaccine, but that really requires confirmation in bigger studies. So if you've been vaccinated, we should still keep wearing a mask. Yes, that's the current advice is that all of us, whether you get vaccinated or not, we should continue to follow the basic principles wear a mask, keep social distancing, and wash your hands. Those recommendations and that strategy, plus people, an increasing number of people getting the vaccine is the best formula for getting a handle on this COVID epidemic. Dr. Gulick, thank you for your time and expertise on this matter. We're truly experiencing history in the making. Thanks, Dean Choi. It's been exciting to be a part of this. As you know, we enrolled one of the vaccine studies right here at Weill Cornell, and we're gearing up to enroll another one with another vaccine that's coming. Lots of progress in this area, and this should really translate to health benefits for all of us, hopefully in the months to years to come. Thank you again. And for everyone who joined us, I hope this has been informative and helpful as we look to a wider vaccine distribution ahead. We'll be back again with more on this important subject. In the meantime, please continue to wear your mask, wash your hands, and maintain social distancing. Take care and be safe. We'll get through this together. Thank you.